taking antihypertensive doesn't make you thrive is guess who has taken blood pressure pills for 30 years? Yours truly. I got off the blood pressure pills when I changed my diet, not my weight. I never, never thought I would be drug free. Somebody comes in, the first thing you see is that they have hypertension or prediabetes, and you start talking to them about putting them on an antihypertensive medication and maybe a metformin, and then you run the American Heart Association calculator and you say, oh, I think that you should be on a statin. When you start adding these meds, a lot of them promote insulin resistance. So they feed on themselves, give somebody a diuretic and a statin, and they're going to need metformin. Then it can go runaway when you get a beta blocker. And so they literally stack on each other for needing more med. And they medications, generally speaking, do not lead to a sense of well-being. They just give you good numbers. John, thank you for coming back. I uh, appreciate you. Good morning, you. John. Yeah, good morning to you. Yeah, I, uh, I, like I said, I don't know what happened. I think we had some technical issues the last time. Hopefully, we won't be plagued by that again today. Well, welcome. It's good to see you. Uh, how are things up in uh, Montana today? Oh, it's beautiful. 17 degrees out snowing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just got a shipment in of some beef from uh, Bozeman, a little uh, oh, cool. ra rancher from called Bellcrest Beef. So I got a big old ribeye I'm going to eat here in a little bit, but uh, it's good to see you. So let me just, for the people who don't maybe remember or weren't here last time, provide us your background if you don't mind. Basically started out in Illinois, south side of Chicago, and always dreaming of getting to a rural location from first memory. And fast forward to when I was about 20, I got a job working at Utah State University in the range science department, which is also like wildland resources, and stayed with them for about seven years, part working my way through college. Got a great opportunity to work with livestock on the range. And one of the things I noticed, even though I didn't stick with that, was that livestock out in on the open range were very healthy. And I somehow thought that there was going to be a connection when I drifted into medicine that I would have something about that would work out. Working with livestock led to interest in medicine, led to human medicine instead of veterinary medicine. Went to Georgetown, graduated there, did my residency in the Army, had a great and family practice. After I got out, the next job I had was here in, in southwest Montana. And it was pretty exciting. I was working in a um, rural hospital about 40 miles from where I am now in Sheridan. And uh, it was a almost 24 seven life of emergency room, clinic, nursing home. And it was exciting in basically you're taking care of your neighbors. So it was uh, um, the 24 seven wasn't too bad for me, but it was bad for my family. So we made it four and a half years. One of the things that I found when I got more into a settled life of clinic medicine is it did not provide joy. I, I just, it was just like a drudgery seeing people in clinic, another visit, another prescription, another year, another medicine. And then I learned about, um, I read Gary Tobb's book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. And my life changed completely because I learned the first key word is if you know what insulin's doing or what harm insulin's doing, you can fix it with diet. And so I can still remember, uh, that's like eight, nine years ago, tell my patients, read good calories. I mean, sorry, read um, why we get fat and what to do about it. That's the short version of Gary Tobb's book. And then you won't think I'm crazy. And then I'll tell you what I think you ought to do. And then come, comes uh, the big fat surprise. And so that was sort of the two foundational eye openers was Get your insulin down and don't fear fat. I stole the don't fear fat from Ben Bickman. But anyhow, once you start knowing those clues, all of a sudden medicine became fun again because you started seeing success. And so many people on that will that are watching here probably have a started on the path to health in low carb. Then it's progressing to carnivore <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as yeah. being a tool in the toolkit. So how's that for, I try to not belabor it. I could talk all day about my fun and practice now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so you are Southwest, you're actually probably not too far from Bozeman if you're in Southwest uh, 
Ms. Uh, Montana. Is that correct? What, where were you at exactly? I'm um, Dylan Montana. I'll dare say that I'm not worried about um, getting canceled anymore. It'd be a relief. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, it's two hours from Bozeman. That's our ma- major airport. Got it. Um, okay. So it's a beautiful ranching community here. Um, so that's one of the benefits I have is a lot of my patients know about livestock. So we can have frank discussions about medicine and at least from a thinking standpoint, they get it. Yeah. So when you said, because you initially you alluded to, you know, the, 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 the cattle out on the open range seemed healthy and good. And what, what, what made that think? Why did you think about medicine when you saw that? What was the connection there? Oh, that's a good, good question. Um, I actually, after I quit Utah State University, because I didn't think it was real world enough um, to be, have a budget to do farming and ranching on the range, you know, at the research station, I worked on a large cattle ranch, um, acreage wise, and there was a a bunch of the um, cattle got pink eye, and we actually did have to doctor them. So I did have a, a doctoring experience on the range. And it was so amazing. It's like, a little bit of antibiotic and your eyes cleared up and it's like, I'm going to be a veterinarian. And a couple months into being pre-vet, which made my life was doing the pre-vet curriculum. I'm so thankful. Um, as, um, the, my advisor said, if you want to be a large animal vet, you're never going to pay off your debts. And it's like, I, by then I was mature enough. I was 25. I was able to listen and it's like, Oh shoot. I hear you. And off to medical school. So, yeah, so yeah. I have doctored cattle on the range, but generally speaking, they were just these shiny, beautiful looking critters with their own calves that they took care of. And there was no, um, it was just amazing out in the desert, this, these, this beautiful specimen, so to speak. Yeah. Interesting on that. And, and as far as, you know, you'd said you'd practice for, I don't know how many years, you know, I'm sure a dec- couple decades in the standard way, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, I mean, what drove you, I mean, you said you read Gary's book, but I mean, did that, um, I mean, how did that change what you're seeing in practice day to day? Did that change? I mean, the, I mean, what were the typical outcomes? What can we expect for people that do the standard of care, I mean, standard of care is what we talk about. It's a legal, legal standard. You know, if you violate the standard of care, you may be liable for liability in a lawsuit. What is the standard of care? What are the results we typically see with that? It was once it learned is that somebody comes in, the first thing you see is that they have hypertension or prediabetes. And you start talking to them about putting them on an antihypertensive medication and maybe a metformin. And then you run the American Heart Association cal- calculator and you say, oh, I think that you should be on a statin because your um, your risk is has crossed some certain threshold, whatever calculator you use. And um, when you start adding these meds, a lot of them um, promote insulin resistance. So they feed on themselves, give somebody a diuretic and a statin, and they're going to need metformin. <laughs> and, and then it can go runaway when you get a beta blocker in there or something not every beta blocker. And so they literally stack on each other um, uh, per needing more med. And they medications don't lead, generally speaking, do not lead to a sense of well-being. You know, they don't, they just give you good numbers, but they don't, um, take an anti-hypertensive doesn't make you thrive. Yeah. I mean, the feeling is guess who has taken blood pressure pills for 30 years? Yours truly. I got off the blood pressure pills when I changed my diet, not my weight. <laughs> Just trying to empathize with my... I never, never thought I would be drug-free. I mean, when I was cowboy and you get off the your horse and run to open the gate to let, you know, when the cattle are coming in and it's like, I'm sluggish. <laughs> That's when you're 24 years old. You feel like crap. Mm. <laughs> What do you, I mean, can you ever remember, because, you know, you obviously have been in, in, in medicine for a number of years now, was there ever a point in medicine that you can remember where the, the reliance on drugs for every condition was not the case? I mean, do we have to go back three generations before we can think about when we actually thought about oh. nutrition or do we know that? I don't know. I don't remember um, it being that way. 
Well, the the nutrition feeds on itself generationally, I believe. I mean, that's a big subject, which is part of this subject. But when I was at Georgetown as a medical student, the, the old docs, gray hairs with white coats had funds of knowledge about doing differential diagnosis, you know, figuring out what's wrong with patients. And it wasn't all just metabolic syndrome. Now, 90% of it's metabolic syndrome. Back then, there was a lot to learn. Now, it's like you can't even, it's like if you haven't figured out where somebody sits on the metabolic disease scale, how can you take it any further? And you know what I'm saying? It's like, if you are have hyperinsulinemia, you got to get that calmed down before we can figure out what else is wrong with you. Yeah. And I, I get, you know, that's something that most still, even today, most physicians are unaware of what someone's insulin is, what their fasting insulin may be. It's, it's kind of considered, why would I test for that type of thing? Um, how do you, I mean, if you see your patients today, I mean, you mentioned, I think you said nursing homes and some other folks, how are you assessing them? I mean, when you, I mean, obviously you can look at, you probably look at somebody say you have metabolic syndrome, probably it's an eyeball yeah. test, but I mean, what do you do? What do you do when you work up and evaluate a patient? First thing I check is a fasting insulin with, you know, fasting glucose as being one of the key measures. And then you look at um, their lipid profile for signs of metabolic syndrome. And almost all of the time, it'll, you find it, you know, and then trying to help people understand that you got, you know, got to get rid of the sugar and starch to start tackling that. And, And one of the things I'm wondering about, and I've been doing more of, is taking people quickly to zero carb to get the effect mm-hmm. because you can dance around and I'm, I'm learning more about this all the time is like, what if just you get too much glucose from your protein? If you know, I mean, as proteins metabolized, you get a substantial amount of glucose. So if you start telling people, Oh, you can have your salad too. Well, maybe there's just those, that extra bit of carb in the salad doesn't work. And that might've worked for Dr. Adkins, but people are sicker now. <laughs> I mean, it seems like it's a runaway. So it's like, maybe we should just get rid of all the carbs and get to the point, get you feeling better. And then we can just start discussing the broccoli, you know, and I have, I have a guy, unfortunately, he uh, did that. He's crushing it. And then he comes in his weights up and this is incidental. I'm glad this didn't happen early in my low carb toward carnivore career is, um, he went into AFib. That wasn't from the diet, I don't think. Mm-hmm. It's just, he was so close. I mean, 69-year-old guy with type 2 diabetes, totally not on meds, hasn't seen a doctor in years. It's like, wow, we can get a handle on this. And then, oh, dang it, you need you'd come in an AFib with all sorts of edema in your legs. The point is um, that I'm hitting people harder, faster with trying to get them under control to see that they have control. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, just out of curiosity, I know when I was, as when I was practicing orthopedics, I was starting to think, well, maybe well, let me do some sort of uh, people come with like carpal tunnel syndrome. And I was like, I think this might be a, a manifestation of met- metabolic disease. And I would check their fasting insulin. And I guess not surprisingly, their fasting insulin was elevated with, with carpal tunnel syndrome, which most people would like, why the hell are you, why the hell is an orthopedic surgeon are you checking fasting insulin? That's the first thing I got. I was like, why are you checking that? But are you seeing a relationship between fat, high fasting insulin and other conditions outside of just say diabetes and things like that? Are you seeing like arthritis or I don't know, mental health issues? What do you, yeah, see, you see it associated definitely. with? Definitely. Just funny on the carpal tunnel, when I show people a cross section of the carpal tunnel. It's like, well, what can you fix in the carpal tunnel by diet? There's structural fat in there mm-hmm. that needs to be there. But what if that shrunk by 3%? Get it? You know, I mean, yeah. or what if you have a tiny bit of edema and you, because what's the um, great, a great diuretic is lower your insulin. Well, that can take away your carpal tunnel. Mm-hmm. And you'll like this, Sean, I've only connected with this in the past week or two, is my hobby is um, hobby is just this trying to explain to ranchers, I say, you have metabolic syndrome and founder is a lay term for equine metabolic syndrome. The um, interesting thing is, for those who don't know, founder 
one of the primary manifestations that makes a horse go lame by damaging the blood vessels and the hooves. And then they go lame. And the typical thing is that the horse has to be put down unless it's a really special horse and you feed it back to health. So I, the connection, I wondered about in humans, it seems like we're so slow to founder, but maybe not. Maybe our aches and pains and the cartilage damage is actually something to do with poor vascular supply because of hyperinsulinemia. And because you, we've all heard the, um, my joints quit aching when I lost three pounds out of my 350 pounds. Mm-hmm. It's not weight loss. <laughs> It's metabolism, right? It's got to be. So, so I'm starting to see even more connections. And the funniest thing is that uh, if you were a um, veterinarian to the rich and famous horse, you know, their, their paradigm is exactly the same as mine. What's your insulin level? And in horses, it's get rid of the non-fiber carbohydrates and they recover. In my patients, it's non-fiber carbohydrates. And then why have the fiber? When it's just going to blow you and make you pass gas. <laughs> so, so it's really funny that if you're a horse in England, you're better off than any of Dr. Unwin's patients as far as your lab access. Well, that's, because you could get an insulin level on a horse there. <laughs> interesting. That is interesting. And I, I've seen that because, you know, I, I saw, I read articles about horses and, and basically diabetes and no more apples and no more, you know, none of these, none of these things that they're supposed to, that they get as treats, I suppose, which surprisingly affects them pretty significantly. Right. There's a question about access in nursing homes and, and have you had any success or ability to affect diet in a nursing home? I mean, those facilities often are notorious for feeding pretty low quality food, I think. Um, I did locally until COVID hit. And before then I had taken some patients from our hospital from the, that had been um, hospitalized for um, serious bacterial infections that were morbidly obese. That, mm-hmm. And often that would start out as somebody has bad edema and their legs get cellulitis. And by the time they seek care, they're, in, they're septic. Yeah. And they have to go to the nursing home to rehab. I was able to go to our nursing home, speak with the kitchen, and basically offer very low-carbohydrate diet to patients included fasting i would swing by there on my way home and have my patients voluntarily fast in the nursing home and we had some hundred pound weight losses in with people in wheelchairs on crutches you know i mean it was a, amazing what could happen right and then um, when covid hit i couldn't get in and out freely and i haven't taken another patient since um from a intensive care to our rehab but it's so amazing if you could do it but it's all was done on my my time, free time, because you can't bill for it. Yeah. But it, but the amazing thing, that's what makes you want to come to work, you know? Um, when you see a guy sitting in a wheelchair lose 100 pounds, and, you know, it's like, wow, you know, and get, it's just amazing. Yeah, but, it puts the, kind of the joy back into medicine, I suppose. Yeah, 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 I mean, it's like, and I experimented, so to speak, on these people because – Nobody would ever complain about to the medical board about what I was doing with these folks because they were happy. And, you know, I mean, it was a very transparent environment. All the staff knew the, what was going on. A lot of them lost weight too. Just watch it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, um, so if you take the worst of the worst um, from a medical standpoint, you know, it's kind of like uh, Eric Westman. I mean, he's got to do quite a bit of stuff because, People are most docs are scared of those patients. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean they're 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 they have a high risk for significant complication and death when you're morbidly obese and have seven or eight underlying conditions. I mean, you know, you know, a, a cold can kill you. I mean, it's 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 one of those things where they are at high risk, and you know, it's it's interesting. There's a there's a nursing home down in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm going to talk with the with the owner of that. And he's actually employing carnivore diets on his on his nursing home patients, and he's seeing like wow. you're seeing he's getting. People that are, again, a lot of these morbidly obese people that they have to live in a nursing home and he, they're getting out of their chairs and walking and losing weight and their glucose is normalizing and all things you'd expect to see. So it's kind of cool to see uh, people doing this thing. Do you, um, as far as, um, well, let me go back to your range science. I know that's back in history, but I mean, when you start seeing people talking about, um, well, 
meat is unsustainable. We can't, we've got to, we've got to transition away from that. And yet you're seeing it at the same time as a physician, basically healing people. Are you, any thoughts on that? One of the interesting projects I worked on um, back in 1982, 83 was um, building a research um, grazing system, sort of testing Alan Savory's ideas. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget. It was so, I mean, for me, it was like dream come true is building all these corrals and fences and stuff. And um, I'll never forget putting the cattle out on a paddock, um, you know, where we were concentrated the um, cattle by tenfold compared to usual management. And by noon of the first day, you could see this is out in the deserts of Utah, how it had changed. You know, they had grazed the whole stinking thing. And I kind of got the idea that with different management, how much more productive things could be. And I've actually kept up on it very closely through YouTube and all that about what's happening now with range. And just down the road from where I'm at, they are like, they graze cattle under setter pivots. And in Montana, they can usually you can get two cuttings of hay. With the cattle, they're, they could have three cuttings using the cattle to harvest instead of the um, mowing it and baling it by the 4th of July, you know. And these cattle are gaining like crazy because they graze it off at the optimum height. So it's a lot. And then it's building the organic matters. It's a long way of saying I've been on the ground where production has increased incredibly and the soil has sequestered carbon i mean i look at the whole stinking country as being halfway fallow <laughs> you know i mean the potential to increase beef production what if iowa corn farms were pasture yeah you know and joel salatin's calculated some of this out to me it's just incredible how much resources we could save if we just actually ate more meat and on the subject if you view fat as something that never goes down the drain, you know, that animal fat is the fuel, just think how much that would save because even a lot of meat eaters are throwing away the best part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. People, no, are, people always ask me, are you eating all the fat on that ribeye steak? I'm like, hell yeah, I'm eating it. <laughs> right. And they're even, a ribeye is probably lean for some people Yeah, could be. for their, for their health. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it could be. I, it, it, so, so, I mean, this is the inevitable question because you're, I mean, this is a, the elephant in the room is people are saying, well, saturated fat may raise your LDL cholesterol and it's going to give you heart disease. And, and that seems to be the, the, the biggest impediment to any of this. What are your thoughts on that? Um, that's an interesting one because, you know, those studies, the Sydney Heart Health, I sometimes in the Minnesota coronary experiment, those weren't published that showed that there wasn't uh, saturated fats, not a problem in and of itself. I think where it comes in actually as being a positive is keeping your insulin down. The studies that showed that saturated fat wasn't an issue didn't get published. And so I, I'll never forget reading Gerald Reven wrote a book, um, Syndrome X, I think it was called, uh, a popular book about insulin resistance because he knew that this was a big a problem, but he said it was written before those studies were popularized. How do we find a happy place between if we call saturated fat unhealthful and we call carbohydrates a problem? How do you figure that out? And it's like, well, if the answer is saturated fat's fine, that's the end of the story. And that's the thing that bothers me is historically there was no signal to question saturated fat. It should never have been questioned because you couldn't see in a population, people having trouble with the lack of it, or I mean, the presence. Does that make? Yeah, no, it makes sense to me. It's, nobody should have said that. And then it becomes a constant thing. It hangs over my head of what are people going to think of me pushing people eating, eating the fat on the ribeye? Is there still such a bias? Well, there is. And if you, I mean, if you do just a cursory look at saturated fat and insulin resistance, there's a whole host of scientific articles saying that saturated fat increases insulin resistance and on and on and on. And that is something that, you know, I think part of that we're looking at, um, uh, you know, there's one high fat, high saturated fat diet decreases insulin sensitivity without, you know, changing intrahepatic fat or something like that. Um, 
So we've had we have those. Why are those studies there? Where where, where what, what when you when you see those studies that show that? What are your thoughts? Well, one of the thoughts is that um, they probably were not a low carbohydrate mm -hmm. diet. They might have been high fat, but not low. You have to get the insulin down. Just seeing it work out so well, you know, just so many parameters get better, and people, you know, everything seems to get better when you get the insulin down, and that's whole insulin issue is creeping into. Um, not creeping into, it's in all the specialties to some degree, whether it's neurology, psychiatry, um, all around. So really that whole worry about the fat, go back and look around, look at what um, people observed before all this whole diet issue from the Kellogg's on. Before that, everybody recognized that sugar and starch were a problem. It was common knowledge and people that fed pigs knew how to make a fat pig and you wouldn't do that to a human. Yeah. I'm, so, just, so, uh, yeah. I'm yeah. not very, I guess I, when I think about this, I know what I'm thinking, but to articulate it, it's like, it's so obvious. Yeah. That, I, just, um, I just pulled up the study and I was just kind of looking at it and the carbohydrate content of that particular was 47% of the diet. There so you go. Still, yeah. It's still, like I said, some people talk about this thing called the Randall effect where carbs and fat simultaneously cause, cause problems. Um, somebody's asking about syndrome X, Gerald Reven, he's, who's the one who actually discovered mm -hmm. or, or coined the term metabolic syndrome or syndrome X. This mm -hmm. is, this is from, I get what, yeah. 1980s or something like that. When was it Reven? Yeah. Seventies, eighties, I think something like that. Yeah. Maybe 78, yeah. Yeah, something like that. So anyway, that's a guy who was a, the initial investigator, maybe one of the first ones that really coined this term. Yeah. Um, you know, it's He was from Gary, Indiana. Oh, he's from Gary, Indiana. Okay, interesting. <laughs> I, I grew up not far from Gary, Indiana. I literally, I went there. I remember doing a track meet in Gary, Indiana when I was a kid. But uh, um, Michael Jackson's also from Gary, Indiana, for those who don't know. Right. Um, let me ask you about, um, you know, when we look at metabolic syndrome, it's interesting to me that LDL cholesterol is not part of that diagnostic. You know, if you, if you look at, it, I mean, the classic yeah. definitions for metabolic syndrome don't don't talk about total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. Why is that? You wonder. Because it just it's so random all over the place um, when it comes to um, people and their risk actually going. When folks have a heart attack, you can't tell what it's not. I don't know why they talk about it exactly because. The thing that happens to me is I see one of my patients has been to the ER and flown off to Missoula for a cath. And then I think, oh, no, they're not on a statin. And then I run the numbers and it's like, oh, they didn't qualify for a statin because they didn't have the high LDL. So in a sense, in my experience, I don't even haven't even seen it. But if you look at those calculators, they're really surrogate calculators for hyperinsulinemia because they're asking about diabetes and hypertension and LDL, I mean HDL cholesterol, and it's like, and you're, so you're looking at all these things that lower the insulin and all your risk factors on the American Heart Calculator go away. So it's kind of funny that people don't put that slight bit of root cause to into effect, you know, um, and say, oh, I can fix this all with diet. And Gerald Reven knew about it. There is, I mean, it seems like in the last few years, there's been an explosion of medications. I mean, I'm looking, I'm, I'm particularly looking at things like autoimmune conditions, ulcer colitis, yeah. psoriasis, you know, yeah. uh, rheumatoid arthritis. These drugs are ungodly expensive. I mean, these are, these are, you're looking at $10,000 for a single injection on some of these medications. I looked at Stellara, the, yeah. the over the counter yeah. cost, you know, without insurance. Somebody's paying, by the way, even though it's, insurance we end up paying it through taxes or whatever oh, yeah. insurance premiums yeah. it's, it's ridiculously expensive and, and and it just seems like it's just people aren't even batting an eye at this stuff it's just like oh well this is a continued thing are you seeing a, a a role for diet in other things besides metab straight up metabolic syndrome definitely one of my patients with rheumatoid arthritis could actually plan on being pain free by just fasting and he knew it was a, that was a very short-term fix, but I, he said, I cannot hurt tomorrow if I don't eat today, mm -hmm. um, which is an interesting observ individual's observation. And he did have um, metabolic syndrome, but the autoimmune things, it's real um, in that I've had people take, do carnivore and succeed. Yeah. And, and then you get into the whole gut thing. Um, 
one of my favorite people, just the way she, um, her bluntness, which is fun, is uh, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. Mm -hmm. You know, I love the way she says, heal and seal the gut. And it starts out with meat broth. You know, I mean, you got to just give the gut the thing that it's the easiest on the gut is meat. Mm -hmm. And then let the gut heal because you know that there's also, it's so plausible that bad things bad things how technical is that are getting from your gut and your blood that shouldn't be there is i know my patients have leaky gut there was a there was a recent study this came out a few weeks ago looking at rheumatoid arthritis and high fiber diets and they found out that the high fiber diets interact with the microbiome to basically increase the the rheumatoid arthritis symptoms so we're seeing some of that being pushed in the literature now if you look if you know how to look for it so you know i was going to say here's a formula for um getting a positive research study, choose a chronic disease, give them a carnivore diet, get a positive result. Next. <laughs> I can't, I'm not a researcher. Well, we, we are, we actually, in fact, to... I'm going to Nashville tomorrow to help arrange that study is going to be done looking at several autoimmune conditions and carnivore diets. So we're going to, somebody, somebody gave some funding to that. And uh, we've got some ranchers that are willing to help supply some of the meat for the study. And so it's going to be kind of cool to get that done. So pretty excited to be part of that. Let me ask you about Montana a little bit. And I've been in Montana a few times over the years, but I haven't spent a lot of time there. You think about a lot of ranchers, a lot of people are outside, they're active. You wouldn't think obesity and would be a big problem. Is is What do you see out there? Is it, is it a pretty significant issue in Montana or is it better than some other places? I think it's very significant here. It's changed so much. Um, and I think some of that's epigenetics that kids are born to overweight mothers and they have a harder time yet. So it's, and and the people that I kind of really push on hard are the ranchers that have metabolic syndrome. And I tell them, if you had help that treated your horses the way you treat yourself, you'd fire them in a heartbeat. <laughs> because I wish ranchers looked buff. And I, I, I'm not going to be shy to um, yeah. on that one. You know, it's like, how come you got a potato gut? <laughs> how crude could I get? Maybe somebody's going to... But I've already told my patients that. So, <laughs> well, I remember when I when we when we met, I think in Denver, I think, and we talked yeah. about that. You were talking about the ranchers need to be a better example because they're out there, and you know, yeah. They're, yeah, they're most likely eating meat. But what else are they eating? They're eating all the sweet tea and you know potatoes and and, yeah. and all the pies and garbage that go with it, perhaps. And I want to say a quick thing: if I don't want to sound crude about talking about somebody's anatomy, mm-hmm. but when you have a formula for how to fix a problem. I find it more chit chatty about the problem. I'm my patients come back, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm really very sensitive. And I also deal with a lot of people that are morbidly obese Mm -hmm. where I'm very sensitive. And they also realize here's somebody that's not scared of them Mm -hmm. and doesn't tell them to eat less, you know, what that's torture. Yeah. Well, let me, let me get into that because if you have a morbid obese patient, you know, clearly that has to do with the diet. I mean, there's no no getting around it. And whose fault it is, you can yeah. you can point fingers one way or the other. But the, the bottom line is, the food is causing the problem. And, and the, the typical answer is, let's put you on a very low calorie diet. You know, 800 calories, maybe shakes or something like that. You starve them, and, and sometimes that works, but it's pretty miserable. So how do you, I mean how are, how is it working that they're eating to satiety? I guess maybe and and, and losing weight. Are you seeing that? The thing is, is that you have to think about something that's can go on indefinitely, right? I mean, a diet you can sustain, right. not this starvation thing. And so basically to eat to satiety, you're talking about meat. I, I observe, it's so funny when I sit down and eat meat, it's like I said, it's, it's like the only thing that gives perfect satiety. But if I were to just start eating other stuff, when does that end? Eating a adequate protein and, and fat diet, these people can do that the rest of their lives. And you, we see that I listen to testimonials quite a bit from your interviews just to keep me going because there is so much negativity in medicine these days because I do have to cope with um, the sickness of that's happened through COVID, both the increased metabolic syndrome. So that's the objective, the hockey sticking of BMIs in kids and the gestational diabetes, all that misery. And then you have the weird thinking that people have magical thinking now. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know what I'm saying? 
I don't know if you know what it's like to be in a medical system now. Three years ago, I could say a guidelines a bunk and people would say, tell me more. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're right. Can't say that now. Well, maybe you can in Montana, but. Well, you um, can't say that. Is. You can't say that in California, it seems like. Oh, just, oh no. And yeah. that's the, that's the irony of. So anyway, there's just so much trouble in Montana and we have all the mental health issues. I, I saw something flash up on the screen. Indian. That's one of the things that that's a pet peeve I want to address is that I've said to patients, how on earth did fry bread mm-hmm. become your soul food? When that when you look at fry bread, you should just think of how terribly your ancestors were treated. Mm-hmm. And when you see fry bread, you should want to just, you know, throw it away. And then say, and when you see red meat, you should say, that's my soul food. Yeah, for and sure. Can't say if I got anywhere per se on that, other than I know it would solve a lot of the mental health issues on the reservation. And I think other docs have talked about that. So I mean, I'm not the first one to say yeah, I, it's a it's partly food, man. I spent I spent several years in Gallup, New Mexico, moonlighting out there, and I would take care of a lot of people then from you know the other Navajo Nation there. And same issue. I mean, they were just eating the fry bread and eating the 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 crap that they are forced on, you know, was I mean, if we go back 150 years, you know, they go from Plains Indians eating, uh, you know, a red meat buffalo bison based diet to stuck on a reservation, and here's your flour, eat all this flour and, and cheap stuff, and and then that it just decimated their population. And of course, the alcohol on, on top of that. So it is a real shame to see what was once a very proud, physically capable, imposing community rent and turned into a lot of people with diabetes. Uh, I remember it was all, it was almost shocking to me to get a native American patient that was not diabetic. I mean, I was, they had such high diabetes and I would see them as an orthopedic patient. Every one of them, they come with a broken this or that. And it was, they all were diabetics. And I was like, this is insane how, how frequent it is. And so, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy to see that. Mm-hmm. Um, there is, you know, it's kind of funny. We're talking about, you know, I, I just, there's an article came out that, again, this is the blue zone, Dan Butner, blah, blah, blah. The people who live to hundred, their secret is to eat whole grains like corn, rice, and oats, greens, tubers, including potatoes, yams, nuts, and complex carbs like beans. That's, that's what they're telling people. It's going to keep them a long time. Are you seeing, cause we all talk about, I mean, y'all hear this. Well, my grandfather lives to 97 years old and he ate bacon and eggs for breakfast every day. Are you still seeing those people, those old timers that are still like back, that still have the habits from 50 years ago? Yes, but their their kids aren't as healthy. Mm-hmm. You know, so the guys my age, I'm in my 60s, not so healthy, you know. And what I find, I haven't been, I've worked on it, but I haven't been really be able to verify this. Something from Laurel Keefe. She wrote the um, vegetarian myth, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. She mentioned... Cache Valley, Utah is being a blue zone. And it's in northern Utah. There was incredible longevity. And the that was all Mormon community or LDS or mm-hmm. what I'm and I lived there for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And it's Nirvana, but it was um from a agricultural standpoint, but it was super dairy. There was always the meat. They never went hungry. And they they had incredible longevity and Oh, this is a fun fact. I worked at Intermountain Healthcare for two and a half years. Mm-hmm. And they had a hospital serving 100,000 people and they didn't have a cath lab. Hmm. Think about that. And those people were, you know, you've heard of Cache Valley Cheese. And I mean, it's a animal product heavy place. And when in, at our walking, when I worked in the walking clinic, they dealt, you know how they dealt with Medicare? No charge. It's not worth it. We didn't even, we don't even know how, can't bill for Medicare. If you went to the ER, you got billed for Medicare. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. but, and so I've lived in a place that where there was longevity coming out your ears. And actually one of my patients that just got on hospice, feisty 103 year old mm-hmm. rancher, yeah, meat eater. So anyway, Weston Price settled that issue of that there's animal products in every longevity diet. And, and, and my dad's a 95 year old Mediterranean diet dude, mm-hmm. you know. Well, but what does what does the Mediterranean diet for him mean? Is it is it like because uh, a lot of people say it's seafood and leafy greens and beans is what they seem seem to think the Mediterranean diet is. It also was brains, tongue, chewing on tripe, 
eating all the organs and oh and they and the butcher would give you a chunk of the fat tail sheep the fat was a door a uh, gift to take home to your mother when the kids sent to the market to buy the meat and you um my dad would say you get the day old the meat that's been hanging a while you get more meat because it's drier mm-hmm. you know and the only thing that he used to say when i was a kid was we cut up our meat they didn't eat big chunks but it was all the time and the last time i talked to him on the phone he goes remember when we went shopping um and we got all that beef i had one of those um uh sirloins or whatever you know i'm going to marinate it up and um have it for dinner tomorrow so and during covid we shipped him uh we ordered him red meat um to ship to him so there you have it, it and they had all the veggies and everything and all the fruit. So it was um, a wonderful thing, but their meat was a big, was there, you know, and his mother was Eastern Orthodox. So they had, um, uh, she had her one day a week where they, she didn't eat meat mm-hmm. and they, you know, they ate fish. <laughs> right. Fish. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's kind of, Anyway, I, it's just interesting to see these old people with sharp minds. And then I have patients with dementia that are younger than me, which I'm worried, not worried, but I test myself all the time. And it's like, oh, yeah, I'm still taking in new information. <laughs> that That is a scary thought that we have people in the dementia that are in their even 40s and 60, 50s now. Yeah, yeah. 60, 50, 40, even in some, some of that. And it's, I mean, I think it's a direct consequence of this metabolic disease that we're seeing so prevalently and uh, that for people who don't know it dementia care is extremely costly i mean both from a from a dollar amount but then if you know a time amount i mean you can't you can't if you got grandma and you're worried about or mom you're worried about her killing herself in the kitchen by setting the house on fire or wandering off that's a lot of resource and worry it's like having a giant toddler you know it's kind of like oh yeah oh it's so sad so and that's the thing that i wonder about um maybe (laughs) Um, is the, when are people going to get an idea that we don't have to wait till our insulin's up to take action? And I granted me checking insulins, I can start treatment 15 years early, you know, Mm -hmm. um, before somebody has the high blood sugar and you may wait for high blood sugar your whole life and just end up with all the other complications of hyperinsulinemia and never get the high blood sugar. How frequently are you seeing uh, hyperinsulinemia in absence of hyperglycemia? How often do you see that? All the time. I'm sure ser- because I know to look. So you see the chubby belly, the hypertension. If I, I saw a lady the other day, it's like your blood pressure's up. Go check your insulin. You know, and her blood sugar was fine. And um, uh, she, you can fix that almost in a matter of a couple of days. Um hypertension nobody told me i had to wait 30 years to find out that it wasn't weight it was sugar or or starch what and what are you seeing as i mean like insulin levels that are that are problematic i mean the average in the u.s is something like eight or nine and most people recommend under five but what are you typically seeing when you start seeing people with hypertension and things like that oh tons in the teens and you know of course the lab value at major labs they put it at 20 something is normal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Up to. Yeah. And so what I, I was able to get our hospital lab to choose the number. And if your insulin levels over 10, I still calculate a home IR, but you don't need to, mm-hmm. if it's over 10, if it's under 10, I, I, that might've been just to be not too extreme. We probably should have set it at six, mm-hmm. you know? And then of course we're not doing the two hour or craft test Mm -hmm. because expensive yeah why would you do that when you're overworked with the fasting insulin numbers giving you enough work you know what i I mean it's it's kind of funny if i dug harder i'd find more yeah that's that's an interesting metric i mean some people say well it it has a lot of very day-to-day variability so it's not as reliable but i mean there's a difference between going from vacillating between six and eight and you know, six and 27. I mean, that's a huge, you know, if you, if you pop oh. in with a 27, there's probably clearly something going on. I, I think that's fair to say. Oh yeah. Um, I, this is something I want to share at this point. Um, if you don't mind is, uh, even though it's unsolicited, um, the other day I was listening to Matthew Phillips. Do you know him? Um, yeah, yeah, the from New Zealand. neurologist. New yeah. Zealand. Yeah. yeah, you, you, about, yeah. You, yeah. Right. Right. Just me. 
Um, I do have sometimes forget where I've met somebody. Um, and I actually found him by searching for um, Parkinson's and um, keto, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. saying somebody must have done the research and he was the guy, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and anyway, I heard him talking about keto for cancer just as an anecdote. And I thought, and I thought I need to try this because my blood sugar always every morning is over a hundred from probably seven till 11, mm-hmm. you know, and I wear a continuous glucose monitor for years, technically type two diabetic. All that. Um, and or I could be type two diabetic next week if I changed my ways. Um, and so I did a four day fast and then I had to stop because I didn't feel like I'd be on target the next day at work, but it changed my metabolism permanent for five weeks. And so the thing, what my experiment was, how can I get my sugar low enough to kill cancer? Mm -hmm. Because it never does go down that low, you know, even though I'm on a zero carb diet most of the time. Mm -hmm. And I just share that is that, that, um, that there's a lot more for us to learn about how to really pound on our metabolism to do resets. Um, that, and that ties in with carnivore because, um, I'm thinking with cancer, and this is just hypothesis, that you want to eat the least amount of protein to be adequate protein Mm -hmm. because you're trying to make cancers devoid, I think, glutamate and glucose. Does that sound? um, Yeah, I mean, uh, the one thing I would- And living on the fat because cancer can't use fat. I mean, most cancers can't use fat. One of the things that I've observed is, you know, I think a fasting, AM fasting glucose- if you have a big steak dinner at 7 p.m., you're probably not fasting yet. You, I think you just need 18, 24 hours to be truly fasting right. in a yeah. carnivore. It's because of the gastric, you know, it, it, you just slow down. I mean, it, your gut slows everything down, so you're still absorbing nutrition for maybe, yeah. you know, 16, 18 hours after a big, big protein fat bolus. So I think it's yeah. maybe that that fat, because I, yeah. I talk to people, I say, hey, try moving, your, try moving your meal up to very early in the day, the day before, maybe noon, and then see what it does. And then many yeah. times you'll see their, their glucose goes down. But certainly fasting is going to do it. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I think yeah. it's pretty clear yeah. that fasting is going to drop your, your glucose for, without a doubt. And I guess what I found is that that didn't come back for weeks. You know, I mean, it would seem, but, but I'm not, I mean, I actually wasn't worried about that. Mm-hmm. It's just when I heard um, Matthew Phillips say, I did this long fast. I think it was just to know what it was like. Yeah. And I did learn another big thing is, uh, from the, this is from the history books is don't forget the broth. You got to get your salt because you do have to supplement electrolytes when you're not eating at all. (laughs) Because I have the advantage of being able to go to the lab and get my labs when I'm in the fast. And it's like, oh, I made myself a little hyponatremic. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's like, why? Because you worked four days straight without eating and you used your extra time to get more done. (laughs) You know, I mean, how many people would like, Say, I'm going to crush it for the next four days, and I'm going to use all my eating time to get more work done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I still, you know, it's crazy. Yeah, but, it's, it's interesting yeah. because many people, you know, they're they're eating, you know, mul- I mean, they're, they're continuously eating all day long from 7 a.m. To, to 10 p.m. It's like they're eating, you know, there's probably six or seven separate feedings a day that people have, and how much time does that take? You know, a lot of it's just obviously open up a package and scarfing down some potato chips, but... You know, sometimes it's three meals a day, and I don't. I mean, I I'm using one or two meals a day. That's my pattern, and so it's very efficient from a uh, yeah. from a from a time productivity standpoint for sure. You know, I cooked my. I did have a steak this morning. And I thought it was kind of funny, um, because my wife bought it, um, thinking I might need it last night, and um, because usually we get it out of the freezer, mm-hmm. and I cooked my steak in three minutes. You, I can cook a steak quicker than you can get through a drive through Yeah. And I have a real humble way to do it is a bacon press and a cast iron pan preheated while I'm doing other things. And then I know, you know, it's just like throw it in, throw the thing on, timer, three minutes, done. You know, and it's like I'll, I chew on my patience. It doesn't take any time to do this. It just takes planning. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, like I said, as we're speaking right now, I have a big old tomahawk ribeye sitting in a sous vide, which took me like literally one minute to set up, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it in a in a grill that goes to 1500 degrees. And it's gonna take me probably uh, you know a minute per side, so that's that's two minutes of prep time, and I'll, it'll probably take me 
three pounds will take me about 15 minutes to eat. <laughs> that'll, be it. that'll be my food for the day for the most part. It's kind of funny. I wanted to um, just get back a little bit to the egg and the things. Mm-hmm. The saying, I, I think it's just um, amazing the um, how soil can be regenerated and um, the potential improvements through animal agriculture. It's, um, it's just probably the biggest part of the lie, you know, mm-hmm. of that we're hearing today from every direction yeah. is just trying to keep us sickly enough that we aren't um, crushing it for better, lack of a better term. That, that is, I mean, I, I mean, it, it clearly, I mean, as, as we see a further and further push to push us away from a, from what I would call a natural human diet and onto this synthetic processed intellectual property diet, I mean, we're just going to see the, the continued devolution of our species and you know, everybody's disabled and everybody's on drugs and it just, it's just not a future that I'm excited about. And so thank you for doing what you're doing, John, fighting the good fight in, in rural Montana. Um, I, I can tell you just love what you're doing. I can just tell talking to you that this this is how much made made your your experience so much better. And I am sure, and we're getting more and more physicians that are that are uh, feeling the same way. And I think we, you know, I think I, I'm optimistic. I think we can continue to do that and turn this thing around. I, I'm I'm confident we can, but we just all have to keep keep all of us have to keep pushing pushing hard. Um, John, where do people go to find you if there's social media that you participate in or if they wanted to be your, your if, if they live in Southwest Montana, how do they, how do they become uh, your patient? No social media yet. Um, well, I have a YouTube channel with nothing on it, um, except for the, uh, little discussion of what Plato had to say in Plato's Republic, which was just exactly what we're talking about. Literally from the carnivore through Sugar makes you call the doctor, literally. Mm -hmm. Um, But basically, I'm really busy and wondering about what's next for me. I can say that out loud because the way the CDC's tentacles have got into the whole country and have given us um, sick brains from bad information. I'm being very vague, but Mm -hmm. it makes me just wonder, what the heck am I doing, you know? to be in the system anymore. Yeah. And thankfully this news, two people in the past week have mentioned carnivore to me. And that's when you know yeah. that um, because you do it all of a sudden you, you say, can I really go back? And I'm not a, I think I'm a almost carnivore. I don't eat much more greens and good dogs eat grass, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably a pretty good, pretty good place to be. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, just to put that note, you know, you asked about where I'm at. It's like, I don't know where I'm at because um, it's it's a real struggle to um, be a part of the system anymore. Yeah. Well, um, I will. I'll just put this out there: we are hiring physicians at Rivero, and our mission is is to use diet and nutrition to, to get people off meds. So, like I said, we're we're looking for yeah. new people that can join us. So yeah. maybe that'd be something. Uh, one, if I have one second, is sure. what I'm in, really interested in is the um, autoimmune, neurology, psychiatry stuff that takes study. Um, the the metabolic syndrome is like it is just accept it yeah. and find somebody to coach you and deal with the addiction, but the other stuff is more fascinating. Yeah, well, we're we're working on it. So anyway, like I said, hopefully it'll be a study on yeah. on autoimmune and carnivore within the next you know, twelve months or so. Hopefully, hopefully mm-hmm. we get out by then. Anyway, yeah. John, thank you so much for doing this. I unfortunately have to go and see. I've got to see a couple consults here in a minute, but. Thank you. Keep the good work. Uh, I'm going to be in Montana in February. I think we went up to Whitefish for for a little week up there, so it'll be interesting. So uh, cool. Enjoy. Good to see. Montana's a great place. I think so. Yeah. And uh, anyway, thanks everybody. We'll be back uh, tomorrow. We'll be back tomorrow. So anyway, you guys take care. Super. Bye bye everybody. Thanks, John. Bye. Mm-hmm.